Um, I want to start by saying, first of all, um, thank you very much for you guys and how welcoming uh, you are to our family every time we come. Um, I would definitely not consider us, you know, insiders in this group by any means because of how rarely we're here, but we make the drive from Omaha because a community like this is so rare. And um, people that are this committed to Christ and this committed to truth are very, very hard to find. Um, and I just want to encourage you guys to continue, continue, continue as much as possible um, in what God is doing here because it is very rare and it's very, very special. Um, tonight I'm going to be diving into hope, um, and probably not from an angle that anyone has ever thought about before. Um, as we get into this, uh, if you, if you follow Corner Fringe Ministries at all, Daniel Joseph, he talks about formula, the faith a lot. And, um, ever since I heard him talk about that, I see these quote unquote formulas in scripture all over the place. And in Romans five, I think we're going to see something pretty profound that if we would press into, um, in our walks, um, it's going to drastically change, uh, what we, how we process the difficult things that happen to us. So, but before we get to Romans five, I've got to lay a couple groundwork pieces to get there. Um, I'm a big picture guy, and I'm sorry. It's going to take me a minute to paint a picture before we're able to drill down to the details. But the first thing I want us to think about is God's infinite eternality. Has anybody ever sat and just thought about what it means that God is infinite? That he literally has existed. We can't even say forever because forever is a unit of time. He's existed completely outside of that. So when he steps in with Moses and says, I am, that is such a profound statement of existence that, I mean, I've meditated on it for years and years and years, and I'm never going to get there. And I'm not going to get there even when I get to heaven. Because if we truly believe God is infinite, then we need to start thinking about it like this. Think of every single revelation of God that has ever been written throughout history. Think of every single counsel that's ever written, whatever theology you want to think about or believe about God. Think about any work of humankind that's ever been created. Gather it all into one place. All of that is a period in one sentence of one book in a library of the reality of who God actually is. And what we have to do is we have to set aside this notion that when we arrive in eternity, we've arrived somewhere. All we've done is arrived in the presence of a God that we now get to experience eternity without time to further probe the depths of who he is and what he's done for us and every single one of his characteristics. There was a pastor um, in Omaha that always talked about he didn't want to get to heaven and be surprised at how much God loves him. Like he just focused so much on the love of God. And I'm like, that's fantastic. But I heard, I heard that a lot. And I'd think that, sit there and think, yeah, what about his holiness? What about his justice? What about his mercy? What about his grace? What about any attribute of God? What if you dedicated yourself to trying to not be surprised by any one of those attributes? characteristics of God when you get to heaven. 
one, you'll spin your wheels a lot because you'll go down these rabbit trails where it's just like, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to understand it. But at two, you start to understand all of these nuanced little things about this life where it's just like, this does not make sense. Well, it starts to make sense when you can get out of the day-to-day -day basic thoughts of eternity that we have and start to rise to that place where God actually exists. So keep that in mind as we move forward. God is eternal and he is completely unchanging. And to drive that home, Another pastor once said, when the finite meets the infinite, the finite must change. So when you have that moment when you are running into a brick wall of God's truth, God isn't going to change. Something in you has to change. Um, moving on a little further, uh, Simeon started a conversation with you guys a few weeks ago about why God allows suffering. Um, phew, that was a bold choice to dive into. Um, there are no easy answers in that conversation. No easy um, conclusions to draw. Um, he did a fantastic job, I think, starting to lay the groundwork on some things. But I want to go in and I want to add to that conversation. Um, because we're going to need it tonight as we move forward. Um, first off, when we say, why does God allow suffering? There are some unstated assumptions behind that. The first unstated assumption is that we can escape suffering, especially in our culture. We think that if we work hard enough and if we store up enough resources, suffering can be put off. Add on to that some theologies today that will tell you you can escape suffering for any one of a number of reasons. And we have been left in a place where we really don't know what to do with suffering when it happens. Um, but the biblical truth about suffering is, boy, it's here. Get used to it. Um, Jesus and the Beatitudes, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then Paul, for you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And again, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Um, so biblically, Jesus and Paul, and then let's go ahead and go on to Revelation. Um, I would say this is going to stand in the face of anyone who thinks we might get a pass out of whatever might be coming on the earth in those days. Um, but Jesus says, because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come on the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. That's encouraging. He's going to keep us from it. But then um, moving on, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So somebody's coming through the Great Tribulation. Somebody's going to be there that experienced the greatest suffering the world has ever known. When he opened up the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So biblically, we've got a pretty clear answer that Suffering is not going to be avoided. Um, another unstated assumption. We don't deserve to suffer. Um, hang on, let me catch up to my notes. Um, yeah, so 
This I don't think is biblically accurate either. I didn't get the verse put up, uh, but Romans 6, 26, um, it's appointed that all should suffer and die once because of our sin. Um, just the sheer fact that we are in sin, that we've committed sin, it's appointed for us to suffer and die. Um, it's also, this assumption is also dangerous because it places our morality and justice ahead of God's morality and justice. We're assuming what is good and right and just with no regard for that which God says is good and right and just. In short, we put God on trial against the standards of our morality and justice. Um, basically, it, it's, it's a reworking of the question why does God allow evil in the world? Well, you're asking that question from what you are deeming as evil and what you deem as right in the world. So what we have to do, though, is we have to start to get God's heart on all of this. We have to understand what God thinks is righteous, what God thinks is just. It's the finite meeting the infinite and we have to change. Um, why we suffer. Simeon got this right on again. Uh, we suffer because of the consequences of sin in our life. Um, and we suffer at the wrath of evil, evil in this world. That can come from men. That can come from powers and principalities. But that's why we suffer. Thinking about the consequences of your sin and suffering from that is vitally important. It's a tool that God uses to purify you and sanctify you. But where I want to focus tonight is on the wrath of evil in this world that comes against us and why we suffer because of that. Um, there is a difference between those two things. And we have to be wise to discern the difference between those because we're going to respond to the suffering of those two things very, very differently. And with all of that said, now we can finally dig in to Romans 5. Um, as we move forward, though, I want to put the term suffering away um, because what we're going to see as we dig into Scripture the terms that fit more appropriately are uh, persecution, tribulations, and trials. Those are the things coming on the outside, putting pressure on you. So let's get into Romans here, 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Paul spent four chapters <laughs> dissecting the faith, getting to this point right here. Romans, I, it, it's very progressive. It's very linear. It makes sense to me. might not make sense to everybody else. But we get to this point. We've been justified in Christ. And we have the right to come before the throne of God as atoned for saints with the full rights of sons and daughters. And then Paul, in English, it's four words, says something that if we haven't stopped already thinking about what it means to be justified in Christ, these four words should stop us dead in our tracks. And not only that. What comes next, Paul is putting on par with what he just said. He's just talked about being justified because of Christ and having access to the throne of God. And he says, and not only that, but something else. Well, what's the something else? 
to glory in your tribulations is on par with being justified with God through Christ. Uh, anybody ever think about your tribulations like that? I struggle with it. And I'm talking about it right now. <laughs> um, but we're supposed to glory in them. The tribulations, the trials, the persecutions that we endure at the hands of this world, we are supposed to glory in. So, we move on, and it turns into this little bit of a formula. that I, I think it's a formula anyway. And it's cyclical. You're going to go back and forth on some things as you figure it out. But there's a progression to what these things do in our life. So we have the tribulations that come. And the words I'm putting up here are actually from King James translation. Because when we start getting into the language, it's going to make more sense. But it's also going to feel a little interesting as we go through it. But our tribulations give rise to patience, patience, experience, and experience hope. And then he goes on to say that hope doesn't disappoint. All right. Now, this is where we start to geek out a little bit because I like blue letter Bible. Anybody use it? Yeah. All right. If you don't use Blue Letter Bible to get into some of the original language, I highly recommend it. Um, I will be happy to help anybody get some basic uh, tools at their disposal for diving in. But um, it is amazing when you start pressing on some of these individual words um, in original language, seeing where else it's used in scripture, what you start to see. Um, as we look at the four words of tribulations, patience, experience, hope, I'm not going to go into hardly any of the Bible verses. But if you guys get into this on your own, you know how to use uh, blue letter tools. Right below this, there's going to be a list of every single verse in the Bible that uses that exact word. And in some cases, you're going to see, like here at the bottom, flipsis from G2346. G2346 is the root word for that. So we might have this version right here, but you go to that root word and you see all these other verses. And you get this second layer of understanding and revelation from what's happening. So, but anyway... Um, starting with uh, what we see as tribulation here. Oppressing, pressure, metaphor, oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress. It's pretty straightforward. But the idea is you are being pressed against from all sides. And you dig into it more and you will see it is a pressing even to the point of death. That's what Paul is talking about, that we're supposed to glory in. Okay. How's everybody doing? Do I need more jokes? <laughs> Lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> um, so, this word, like not even going into the root word, is used in 15 books in the New Testament. So it is an established point that the Christian church was understanding persecution. So we as Americans, though, I don't think have much idea on a doctrine of persecution and tribulation. We haven't been taught. We haven't been given it, so we don't know how to respond to it. We're not good at understanding why we're enduring it. We don't understand where it comes from. Um, and I'll go ahead and throw this out there for consideration. The prosperity gospel has roots that reach its way into so many aspects 
of our theologies that I don't think we fully realize it all the time. The idea of escaping persecution, trials, of we shouldn't have to endure this, there should be a way out of this, I think is very much rooted in a prosperity gospel mindset. And I say that because when you're talking to people about these things, it's just something to be cognizant of that you're battling, ag- well, you're battling against a power that's been put out there. It's a false gospel. It's a false doctrine. And you're going to have to deal with it at some point. And so I would say it's recent. It's a very historic recent mindset. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. 100% agree. All right. Mm, what do we want to go to? Okay. So God uses the pressure of persecutions and trials to produce patience. Digging into the next one. Steadfastness, consistency, endurance, patience is how it's translated. Um, this is one that's interesting when you get into the root word of it, um, there was this whole other layer of the idea of patiently waiting on the Lord. And that's why I threw Isaiah 40, 31 in here. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. We glory in the tribulations, which leads to patience, because we're waiting for God to show up. We're waiting for God to be our strength and our provision. The persecutions, the trials, it's a testing of our faith in him to be our provider and our strength. And we go through that. And then you start to realize, this is back to the beginning of where I started, God has no timeline that he's trying to keep. Time doesn't exist to him. His only concern is with a finished product. He's, he, knows, he knows how long your life is, obviously, And he is going to do what he needs to do in your life to refine you to the point that you need to be at to cross over and meet him face to face. But in his eternality, he has no concept of time and the need to meet a deadline. Did he invent time? I don't know. I mean, he certainly created the things that mark time, but does he understand it the same way we do? Absolutely not. All we know is time. Got to get this done. Got to get that done. My kids are growing too fast. Time's slipping away. How am I going to have enough saved for whatever point I want to be at in life? It's everything we do is driven by time. The only thing God is driven by is the product. And that's why I inserted Malachi uh, 3.3 in here. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Um, Rabbit trail you can go down. Dig into what it takes to purify metal. And no one's going to tell you, well, it's a 37 second process to get from this point of purity to this point of purity. Every single time you purify metal, it's, it takes what it takes. And you never know how much dross you're going to have to pull off the top. You never know how long you've got to keep that metal in the fire to get to the point that it's truly pure. So God sits as a refiner and a purifier of men. 
of women. And that's all he's concerned about, is getting us to that point. So we're going through these trials and tribulations. We are patiently enduring this process. We're glorifying God through what we're experiencing because it's giving rise to this process in our lives that's getting us closer and closer to where God wants us to be. So this is just my slide reiterating these concepts. He's only concern, he only concerns himself with the finished product. But eternity is waiting for us and we're temporal and finite and have no idea how to prepare for that. Like, has anybody ever sat and thought, wait, when I die, when I'm there, or when at the end of all things, I'm taken to be with him, it's forever. Forever. What are you gonna do? What's it gonna look like? Are you gonna get bored? Are we gonna be able to fly? Jesus went through walls. We have a physical body. What is this gonna look like? And I think this process that Paul, in just a few words, flies through, is the beginning of starting to understand some of that stuff. This process of moving through tribulations to perseverance, to pay, or patience, to experience, to hope, is the beginning of that process of helping us to start understand eternity. So, we're patiently waiting, we're patiently enduring, and then we get to move on to what is experience. Proving, trial, approved, tried character, a proof, a specimen of tried worth. When metal's purified, before it gets sold, what do they have to do? You have to issue some sort of certificate stating the purity of that metal. And if you are the refiner of that product, you have to be willing to certify and stand behind this is what it is. Because there are tests that you can do on any single metal that tells you whether that metal is as pure as they say it is. It's the same thing here. The, the idea that we are not tested in our faith is again one of those concepts, one of those things that I'm just like, how do you look at scripture? How do you look at these concepts? And how do you not see that we are daily tested. Every single, every single opportunity we have to sin or not sin. And boy, I have a lot of these conversations with my children right now. Um, I was sharing with, who I don't remember who it was before. If you're gonna teach on something, Remember that in the lead up to teaching on that, you better be prepared to experience it in your life. And, you know, teaching on suffering, teaching on persecution, trials. Um, last Saturday, one of my kids comes up from the basement and said, one of the twins just jumped on a carton of almond milk. Oh, okay. Go downstairs. Yeah, he jumped on it and it exploded over everything. We had a shelf of stuff in the basement. It is all over that. And it took me until Tuesday with everything else going on in the family, all the other kids acting out to be like, oh, this is probably all because of what I'm trying to put together for Saturday. And it's just another one of those times where God's going... You made a deal with me that you were never going to teach on anything you didn't have in your life. So do you really believe this? Do you really believe in glorifying in your tribulations? Do you really believe that this stuff is moving you to a place of hope? 
So I grilled up that sandwich and ate it between Tuesday and Wednesday and started to, you know, calm myself down as the rest of the week went. Hopefully my wife will attest to that. I don't know, but we'll see. Um, but when we go through those first two steps and we get to the point that we are approved and our character is tried and true, only then do you get to, to the point, and I'm going to skip that one. That was just uh, going into the root a little more. But only then do you get to the point where you begin to boldly live with a deep-seated confidence in the power that God has given us to overcome. And that's why you see Paul take the progression in Romans 8 that he does where he says, yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've come through persecutions, trials, tribulations, and you have overcome because of the power of Christ in your life, you get to this point where it doesn't matter what comes against you anymore. You get to this point where you know you're more than a conqueror. I'm not there yet. Some of us here might be. I hope we are (laughs) because we need people to lead the way on this. But that confidence doesn't come from anywhere else other than having gone through the trials and seeing God bring you out on the other side. Another example of this, David. I mean, if you get into his life, start to study when he wrote the Psalms that he did. Um, I think Psalm 23 is a great example of, man, he's running for his life from a crazy king that he's supposed to take after. And this king used to love him. And yet he's still sitting there acknowledging who is ultimately leading him and what God is actually doing in his life. You prepare a table before me. You anoint me in the presence of my enemies and my cup overflows. That is bold confidence in what God has brought him through and where he's going. So then we get to hope. Um, Dig into the verses on hope. Um, I didn't, I didn't spend hardly any time uh, going into Bible verses on this because There are so many places we place our hope. There are so many people we place our hope in. But at the end of the day, what's the only thing that's going to stand? And that's hope in Jesus Christ. That's hope in our salvation and hope in the life to come. Um, There is an interesting rule or set of rules that people in certain prepper communities will talk about. And it's the rules of three. Have anybody ever heard of these? So they're pretty simple. Three minutes without air, you die. Three hours without shelter, you die. Three days without water, you die. Three weeks without food, and you die. Granted, these are simplified, these are averages, but it's a good way to think about how we live life. So these rules were written, and actually some people went back and said, wait a second. So we've basically got every single way that we measure time in this list. We've got minutes, hours, days, weeks. But there's one missing. Three seconds without hope. Three seconds without hope is all Satan needs to plant a thought in your head that you might make a decision on that you never come back from. 
He knows it. And it's important for us to know it too. That if we live without hope, or we live with a hope that's going to fail us, that three seconds could pop up at any minute. And if we haven't galvanized our character by overcoming the tribulations, waiting on God to be the provision to rescue us from that, this can sneak in and we'll never have any idea what hit us. So what do we do with this? Like, we know we're supposed to glory in the tribulations. How do we arrive at the point that we can actually do that? If you follow Jamie Walden, I think a couple of you guys in here do, he's constantly saying, train for the battle you are not yet in. Um, I was exposed to another idea years ago that you settle things at the extreme with God. Your finances. If God asks you to give 100% of your paycheck this week or this month, because he said to do it, would you do it? Well, how far does your obedience go then? If you say no, well, am I okay with 50%? Am I okay with 20%? How far does your obedience go? But if God is asking for it all, you've got to settle the extreme. If he calls you into ministry, into a dangerous area, are you willing to lay down your life for ministry? Are you willing to lay down your life for the sake of Christ? Maybe I'm not, you know? How far are you willing to go? These are the areas, mentally and spiritually, that you can train for the battle you're not yet in. Are we coming to the end of all things? We talk about it a lot here. We like to look at signs. We like to try to figure it out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and say one way or another. But at a bare minimum, I think we can look out on the world and see things are changing. At a bare minimum, the American currency is going to crash. It is an unsustainable future. At a bare minimum, our culture is about to drastically change. We have had too many new people come into this country to not see the culture change. It could change for good, could change for bad, but one way or another, it's changing. We don't know what yet, way yet. But are we thinking about these things? Are we trying to get God's heart? And are we settling it at the, at the extreme? Are we preparing ourselves mentally and spiritually for whatever might come? If we are coming to the end of all things and that we are the generation that never dies because we see God, or we will be in those tribulation saints. Have you thought about what it takes to maintain your testimony as a sword is potentially raised above your neck? Or worse yet, maintain your testimony and encourage a loved one at that same moment. These are not easy things to process, but these are realities that we as followers of Christ, I truly believe need to be meditating on. Because how committed are you? Will you be faithful to the point of death? Has your life been marked by glorying in your tribulations and your trials to the point that your character has been galvanized, that your hope is so real that you have no problem moving through these times. 
that's all pretty dark and bleak. But um, when I was in high school, there was this guy who took us through a Bible study about the book of Revelation. And I remember thinking, man, it'd be pretty cool to live in that generation. Fast forward 20 years, oh, well, maybe we are living in that generation. But there is a great hope for the people of God who live in that time. We are either going to be miraculously spared from what's going on in the world. Maybe we can say that. There might be scriptural basis for that. Or we are going to be a people in God's kingdom that experience the greatest tribulation the world has ever known. Which means if we followed this process that Paul's laid out for us, we will enter eternity with the greatest hope that has ever been known. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for the truth of your word. We thank you that you are a refiner and purifier of our lives and that you are gentle and good to us and you seldom give us more that we can bear, but you also know what we can bear. And more times than not, it is way more than we think we are capable of, but you know what it will take to get us to the place that you want us to be. God, would you soften our hearts? Would you soften our spirits to the reality of the persecutions and trials that come against us from the evil of this world and that we can truly glory in those because it is going to produce a work in our lives that will only be able to glorify you in the hope that we're able to take to the world. Be with us this week and help this word to sink deep into our hearts. In your holy and precious son's name we pray. Amen.